last week we were introduced to David, that apple-cheeked little boy whose responsibility was to watch over sheep as they grazed in green pastures. And Samuel had been in town looking for the next king. And after standing in front of all seven brothers and rejecting them, Samuel looked at David and recognized this good shepherd's good heart. Good shepherd, though, as I said last week, David was often distracted trying to catch butterflies or singing and playing his harp and daydreaming. But have no fear if a predator approached, he could whip out his slingshot in 10 seconds fat, flat and use a single stone to put down even a lion or a bear. Oh, my. <laughs> and that skill comes in pretty handy in today's story. So, as you heard, one day his brothers were on the front lines of a battle, and it seemed like the tribes were forever at war with the neighboring Philistines, although to say they were at war kind of implies that they had stood a chance of defeating this much larger and much better equipped army. Tribes thought if they had a king, that would help them gain victory. And it started out true. One of new King Saul's greatest accomplishments was to organize 12 squabbling tribes into their first ever victory. All hail King Saul. The Philistines could have completely crushed little Israel. I mean, that's what they did to every nation in their way of global they understood it, global domination. Because you see, the Philistines had a technological monopoly, technological monopoly on iron. If you wanted so much as a cooking pot, let alone a sword or shield, you had to go to the Philistines to buy it. But they did have one weakness. See, one time after a victory, among all the material goods and all the people they took to make into slaves, the Philistines took the Ark of the Covenant. Big mistake. Big. That box contained the sacred stones on which the Ten Commandments were inscribed. That box contained the very presence of God. Do you remember the plagues, you know, the ones one after the other in Egypt until Pharaoh let them go? Well, here, whenever the Philistines took that box, wherever it went, each city would soon be overrun with rats and the people covered with tumors. Now, some translations say hemorrhoids. <laughs> Don't know which is worse. <laughs> but finally, to neutralize it, they put the box in the temple of their god, Dagon. The next morning, however, they found the statue had fallen over face first in front of the ark. Well, it must have been an accident. They put it back up. And the next morning, it had fallen again. But this time, its head and its arms had broken off. The Philistines recognized they clearly had a problem on their hands. And so they returned the box along with a gift of five golden tumors or hemorrhoids and five golden mice. Bizarre story, right? You know, straight out of the Bible. But it explains why the Philistines didn't or couldn't just wipe these little tribes off the map. Because the God of Israel was too strong. So they just continued to bully, harass, and threaten them. And so that's where we are today. This is another battle. And David's father sent him to to bring provisions to his brothers and bring news back home. And when David arrived, he was surprised to just see everyone standing around. There was a standoff between the armies, and to break the stalemate, an offer had been made. Instead of whole armies, each side would just send one soldier, mano a mano. Except this would be mano a big mano, a giant almost 10 feet tall. Of course, who knows how tall he really was, but you know what the average size of a man back then was? Five feet. And this guy stood head, head, head above them. And he wasn't just call, tall, he was, he was built. He was the cover of a men's fitness magazine built. <laughs> Solid muscle, 
hidden, though, behind 126 pounds of armor. Biceps capable of throwing a spear the size of a fence rail, its tip alone was 15 pounds. And so no one would agree to fight. He intimidated everyone, except David, who couldn't understand why grown men would be afraid of a mere human when God is so much more powerful. I'll do it. His older brother told him, go home and let the men take care of the manly things. David rolled his eyes, told one of the other soldiers, I'll do it. So they took him to King Saul. And David said, don't give up hope. Don't give up hope. I'm ready. I'll go fight this Philistine. But Saul took one look and just laughed. But David said, I can do it. I'm a shepherd, and whenever a lion or a bear, oh my, tries to take one of my lambs, I go after it, knock it down, grab it by its throat, wring its neck, and kill it. And I'll do the same thing to this giant. And since no one else was willing to try, well, why not? So Saul covered David with armor and put a bronze helmet on his head, but it was all so heavy that David couldn't even move. He had them take it off, and then he walked toward Goliath, stopping to pick up five stones along the way, feeling each one in his hand before slipping it into his pocket. And he approached Goliath with a sling in his hand, and Goliath saw this and roared with laughter. So imagine the voice of James Earl Jones, okay? <laughs> this is what you send, an apple-cheeked, peach-fuzz little boy. Am I a dog that you would come after me with a stick? Come on, I'll make roadkill of you. Now imagine the voice of Linus from Peanuts, which I can't quite do as well with this chest thing. You come after me with swords and spears and axe, but I come at you in the name of God Almighty, and this day God is handing you over to me. Remember, this is now the Linus voice. I'm going to cut off your head and serve up your body to the crows and coyotes, you and every single other Philistine. This battle belongs to the Lord. <clears throat> Provoked by this little pipsqueak, Goliath picked up his spear and started marching toward David, his big feet pounding the ground. David pulls his hand into his pocket and pulls out of a stone, puts it in the sling and slung it. And he hit the Philistine on the head so hard, down he went. Now, if this were a Hollywood movie, David would have missed the first four times. <laughs> one stone would have gone too far, one stone would have bounced off his armor, one stone would have wildly hit a bird, and another one somewhere else. But then, Music swelling. Imagine him fumbling the last stone caught in his pocket and he's trying to get it out. And just as, as, as Goliath is going to pounce with a second to spare, David took his stone, got it around, and put him out. And he fell straight forward down into the dirt. And then David jumped on top and did what he promised to do and cut that giant's head off and gave it to Saul while the Philistines ran screaming for their life. Of course, to see that final scene would depend on whether the rating was PG or R. <laughs> but David was elated with, I mean, excuse me, Saul was elated with the victory. And he was so happy until he realized people were chanting David's name and not Hail King Saul. Saul seethed with jealousy which is just the first of many times to come, as we will see next week. This week, David's special ability involved a slingshot, and next week, it will be his harp. So, who doesn't know the story of David and Goliath? It's not only an iconic biblical story, I mean, it's culturally iconic, right? Everybody knows. It's the little person taking down the man like Norma Ray, inspiring factory workers to unionize. 
It's like Aaron Brockovich against PG&E. It's like Bree Newsom. In the aftermath of the murder of nine African Americans at Wednesday night Bible study at Mother Emanuel AME in Charleston, well, Bree climbed up a flagpole on the grounds of the South Carolina State Capitol and took down the Confederate flag. And as she ascended, she quoted David's most famous psalm, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not fear. And as she descended, she quoted David's speech to Goliath. She said, you come against me in the name in, with hatred and oppression and violence. I come against you in the name of God. Now, Bree was raised in and raised and nurtured in the church. Her father was the dean of Howard Divinity School. So she knew scripture. She was well-versed and understood the religious, not just the cultural meaning of David and Goliath. And you know, so did Colin Kaepernick, who grew up going to Sunday school every Sunday and was confirmed in the Lutheran church. His David quietly knelt on the football field against a giant Goliath of racial oppression. Did you know his body is covered in tattoos of scripture passages? Or this Pride Month, we remember the riot at Stonewall Inn where queers and drag queens like Marsha P. Johnson and Sylvia Rivera had enough of constant police harassment and they fought back. Someone picked up a cobblestone like David's stone to slay a Goliath and no one could believe that anyone with so little power would dare fight back. But look where we've come today, because they did. So we can all come up with lots of examples like this. Google modern David and Goliath and you'll get lots of, lots of ideas. But I have a different question for you today. Who, who is your Goliath? Who stands towering over you, or perhaps better, what is a Goliath? Might it be a giant fear, 10 feet tall? Goliaths keep us up at night with questions. Maybe like, will she get through all these treatments and side effects? Or this dysfunctional relationship at work or maybe even at home that looms 10 feet tall. Or maybe it's even a real bully. Perhaps it's seeing something coming down the tracks toward us fixated on this Goliath-sized train when all we really need to do is simply step off the track. Because fear paralyzes. We can't move. Maybe it's because we're just covered in too much armor. You know, a self-protective shield. So covered in armor that we're always on the defensive. Even with people just trying to help. People from whom we've asked for help. Sometimes our armor is, I don't need any help. Take off the armor. But taking off the armor makes us feel vulnerable, right? Brene Brown would say that's exactly what we need. She said, I was raised in a get her done and suck it up family. Very Texan, she said. And the tenacity and grit of my upbringing has served me, but I wasn't taught how to deal with uncertainty and how to manage emotional risk. I spent a lot of years trying to outrun or outsmart vulnerability by making things certain and definite, black and white, good and evil. My inability to lean into the discomfort of vulnerability limited the fullness of those important experiences wrought with uncertainty. A healthy faith welcomes vulnerability. It frees us from the 126 pound burden of certainty. Now, ironically, many religious people think that faith is believing the correct things, assigning good and evil, right and wrong, but a healthy faith 
frees us from the need to be right and see things as black and white. Because don't we recognize that God is present in both light and shadows, in joy and in grief, in our best moments, as well as the worst moments of our lives? So David knew that only his vulnerability, taking off his armor, only that could allow him to win against his Goliath. He stepped forward because he believed and then demonstrated that his weakness was God's strength. And that's how we defeat our Goliath too. Shedding that protective armor we use to keep ourselves from feeling or being honest. What is your Goliath? Goliath. 